looks like we are live. Hey, welcome everybody to the Origin of Life. I'm David Guillo, and this is Nebula on the desk there. We might see her. And I'm so glad you could join me. T tonight's topic is going to be, what is life? Can we define life? And let me tell you a little bit about this channel. So it's all about the origin of life, the what we recently found through science and physicists such as Jeremy England. And I recently wrote a book on the topic and talking about how we get ordered structures from entropy. And I call it optimally dissipative configuration. And I'll be checking to see if there's anybody on the chat live that would like to tell me where they're watching from and if they have any questions for us. So the point of this video and this channel is to go live and interact with the world possibly as to how we feel about the origin of life and making some friends and to see if there are people from different places in the world that have different like opinions or views on is it a question of science? Is it a question of philosophy? Is it a question of religion? So a lot of times when we talk about other science like gravity, you know, or math, we can agree that two plus two equals four and gravity has a formula and it's predictable. But this is where the similarities end. So today we're gonna to talk about what do we mean by life even? So, and I speak as a biologist, I have my degree in biology and I'm just an amateur physicist. And it turns out we don't actually have a absolute definition for life. Life is really, we, we, we observe things, we see things, and we give it a name. But is it an absolute thing in the world? And we're going to talk about chaos theory today and how, for example, if you have DNA and we all come from DNA, let's say, well, that DNA was a very ordered structure to begin with. And so it really can't be anywhere else in the universe, although if we change our definition of what life is, it might be all over the world. Now, Nebula is young and she's new and she may not know what fire is yet, so this is very hot. Yeah. So we have, hey, Ted Brenner, thank you. Yeah, you're, you're my friend. And actually, it turns out that this is good practice for me to, to show and teach what I know about the origin of life and my new book. And also, we're going to talk about Jeremy England's book, Every Life is on Fire, and what he thinks about what the origin of life is. And we can actually start with this now, because I'm just starting to read it. And a lot of what I know and teach has to do with what this gentleman, Jeremy England, let's see if we can get a photo of him pop up there. This is all live. And what he says is that actually, Life is just a natural thing, and it's as natural as rocks rolling down a hill. And that seems counterintuitive to me because life is a complex thing, and I thought entropy was everything going from order to disorder. So aren't we going against the grain? And that's, that's that question that's always kind of um, baffled me, and I'm, I'm taking it, I'm looking at it from a, a puzzle point of view. How do we solve that puzzle that we being here are super complex, super ordered, and yet everything's supposed to go from order to disorder. And this is where it's so baffling and confusing that what happens with human, humans is that we need to come up with an explanation or a story or a belief system. And usually we, the consensus up until maybe this decade is that you need a divine intervention. You need a God, you need a, a human-based thing with a hand that's gonna say, okay, I want humans here type of thing. And it turns out that, no, with thermodynamics and physics, we're, we're able to get real answers. And when I say real answers, I mean, when we say two plus two equals, well, divine intervention. When we say, um, when we don't know about something, we just kind of make up a story around it. But today we can say, no, we, 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 we have real models and real computations as to how and why we're here. And this is what I like to share. So this is out of Jeremy England's book, Every Life is on Fire. When we look for what a living thing is, and his thing is he wants to find out through thermodynamics what a living thing is. And so he says, for example, they, uh, life, they make copies of themselves, they harvest and consume fuel, and accurately predict the surrounding environment. So I love that definition. It also, so it doesn't say it's humans, it doesn't say it's gotta be a critter. And we're gonna observe things like hurricanes and storms and fire even, and see how, in a way, 
without DNA, we have other forms of life all around us, which is what we kind of need to be open-minded to if we're gonna find life elsewhere in the universe. Let's go over to the holodeck. So, so this used to be Days Post-Apocalyptic World YouTube channel, and today it's, um, it's still taking place in this old building that you see here, and we're zooming in on it. And you saw probably a dinosaur behind me there, and that was actually constructed through 3D printer, printers that I um, put together um, on this channel. You can see how it was, it was built, actually. And so here we're gonna see and take a look at different scenes. So this is a hurricane here. And we, when we open our minds, we can kind of see a lot of things happening here. First of all, this is a very much ordered structure and it has a beginning and an end. And okay, this is my cat. I was gonna explain how the, um, the, the arrow of time with that. But as we're talking about the uh, what is life? Why don't we go to YouTube and I've got a couple of things queued up for us here. So a few years ago, I actually made a long um, video about how, how and why we're here, the origin of life. And here's what we had to say then about where... Go ahead and maybe agree on some things that we would say are living such as, of course, humans, plants, bacteria, butterflies, things that we feel at a gut level are living. They're, they're beautiful, they're complex. Non-living would be things as rocks, mostly anything on this table, things that are inanimate, things that kind of just sit there would be non-living things. Very broad definition. And then there are some things that we might say are questionable or we might have a conversation about it, such as fire has some lifelike properties. A virus, is that a living thing? Some say yes, some say no. Robots, which make up more and more parts of our lives, becoming more and more intelligent, would they be considered living? If we were looking over a distant planet and we saw a coral reef, so on this planet, it's, it's living, of course, but would we recognize that as such in a foreign planet? Things like weather systems, ocean currents, thermal vents, all very dynamic. Life is around these things, but we, we, would we consider these things as being living? And of course, the Earth as a whole, is that a living thing? So the point of that little exercise is to remind ourselves that whether you are a confused cat which doesn't know a cucumber from a horrible monster, or you are an expert in your field, the definition of, definition of life is not always clear cut. But and now we're gonna show what our man Jeremy England has to say about what is life. Question that in many ways has, has probably been on all of our minds in, in one way or another at some point. Uh, and what is life as a question is often treated like it's a very hard question or a subtle one, and of course it can be if you think about it in the right way. But in another sense, I'd like to put to you that it's in a sense, it has a very simple answer that we all know. We know many examples of things that we would all agree upon are alive, and we also have many examples of things that we would probably agree upon saying are not alive. And of course there are border cases, viruses and such, you know, that we can always look for kind of the fractal boundary between categories. But at the end of the day, we have a lot of good examples of each. And so one practical approach you could take is to stipulate that we know what living things are as a group. And now the question is, what can we understand about what they have all in common with each other? We can, in a sense, try to tease out the features of that group that really turn out to be the main determinants uh, of what makes us think that something belongs in that category. And I think that once we take this approach, what we realize is that there really are multiple languages that we have for talking about the world and what it is, even within the natural sciences. Uh, so I'm giving this talk in English. I would say most of the talks probably that are given in this room about physics are given in that language. Uh, and, and even about most of the talks about science at MRT, MIT are given in that language. And yet I would argue to you that if someone's giving a talk about biology or about physics, there's another sense in which they're really speaking different languages because 
in biology, we take for granted that life is a phenomenon where we know what it is, and then we're trying to make sense of how it works, and you know, what makes something live or not live, uh, et cetera. Whereas in physics, really at the outset, what we're starting with is a way of talking about the world. I think we will get back to this, and first we're going to go back and talk a little bit more about Jeremy England and what he has to say. We're gonna go over to the, our big wall over here. Indeed, we find life in all sorts of places on our planet that we wouldn't think are hab habitable, whether it's like at the Yellowstone Park and those acid baths, or even deep in the ocean or high up in the atmosphere. Like in Jurassic Park, life always finds a way. So what this contraption here is, it's, I call it the atomizer. And what we do here is, it's a simulation of what happens to atoms turning into molecules in a very quote unquote random way. And this is to simulate the primordial ooze, let's say, of uh, early Earth. And so this, this is gonna vibrate and these ping pong balls have various magnets on them. So we always end up with a different outcome and a, a different structure each time. And with our theories on the origin of life, Jeremy England will say that it's um, ad adaptive dissipation. And the idea is that if there's a source of energy or a fuel or something that has potential energy to be dispersed, given enough time and enough random interactions with it, complex structures emerge. And it happens at the chemical atomic level and it happens on every scale up to it. So if we think about humans, how they need to find food and fuels and how all those fossil fuels that were underground for millions and millions of years, we made use of that and, that, and we built complex structures in order to optimize our survival. And so this theory of optimally dissipative configuration that you will find in my book, The Symphony on Entropy, available at Amazon, it, it shows us on every scale and every level how and why we are here and if we're alone or not. So now we're gonna have a fun little exercise and this is gonna vibrate. So I've got this special button that I'm gonna press here. And it's gonna drown out the noise and give you some music for 30 seconds. Okay, I hope I timed that correctly. So this, we can all agree that this seemed kind of random, right? It was uh, chaos. However, if we were to, let's say, slow it down and see the final structure here, it is unique. It'll never happen again. And the reason it happened this way is because of things like optimally dissipative configuration and adaptive dissipation, where it's not random at all. These things occurred the, they, it couldn't have occurred any other way and also we couldn't have predicted them because also because of chaos theory where the the minor differences in the initial conditions as well as the we don't have all of the information as to how and why things interacted with each other so it's it's quote unquote random in, in a sense but it was very precise and it only went in one direction always 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 the optimally dissipative configuration if two molecules got close to each other and they had something to do, they would do it. If not, they don't. And this applies again to every level and scale of humans and living things and down to the molecular level. You've probably before seen this diagram. Again, it's, it's on the cover of your book, The Symphony of Entropy, available at Amazon. And it's, it used to to show how this is the Big Bang, for example, and it's gonna go towards entropy. So we've heard before, we all made, we're all made of stardust, and today we can actually see and demonstrate how it is that we're all made from stardust. 
and how we end up here. So as the Big Bang goes towards ultimate entropy, and that's gonna take trillions and trillions of years, we're here for a long, long time, we're just at the beginning of this process at 13.8 billion years into the process. And on its way there, it organically and normally creates galaxies, and or, which is another ordered structure, and planets and planetary systems. And if they have enough time, I guess I should go here now. And if we have enough time, then if an asteroid doesn't hit the life, then things always get more complex if they have the opportunity. And around here, I've got all these posters of energy sources and cycles of such. And th that's to demonstrate that be even before life was present, we had complex systems within our atmosphere. And even though we, we may not call it life today, they were very complex. And they also had those accurate descriptions that Jeremy England had before about being able to reproduce, being able to um, co harness energy. So, don't have any more questions currently, but thank you. This is great practice for me. In 10 to 20 years, maybe people will see this as my humble beginnings and as, as I'm getting my dialogue out and I'm learning how to do it, this is very good practice for me as well. So over here is the chalkboard where I like to pretend I'm a professor. And so the basics of how life came from non-life are demonstrated here. And one of the first puzzles that, that came to me when I was very young, and somebody said to me, because they, they were promoting the, the divine intervention type of theory for how life is here, and they would say, okay, take us a Boeing 747 airplane, for example. Very complex structure, millions of parts, all working together very intricately in order to serve humans, serve man. Otherwise, it wouldn't be here. And so they would say, so, but a human created that. And so we take the model of us and say, well, we're made up of trillions of independent pieces working intricately with each other in order to, what's the analogy, serve something else. And it was created by something else, the question mark here. And obviously, if we don't have any other answers, we come up with the, the, the divine intervention and a God of some kind that made us. Uh, today though, we have what I would say are real answers based on entropy. Because in fact, all living things, and this is the key here, all living things are very complex structures that ultimately increase the entropy of the universe more so than if they weren't there. So if we go to this little diagram here with the two round things, those aren't boobs, I promise. Um, these are planet Earths. And the one over here, as we zoom in on it, I have such a big crew here, I keep them all in line, you know? And so this Earth here has a lot of potential energy happening in its atmosphere. It's, uh, the sun's beating down on it, it's sending all those uh, ions and electrons, and it's accumulating, pause camera. It's accumulating all this potential energy, but there's nothing there to do anything with it. So what do we do? Um, we have like our model over there, all these electrons. If there was a complex configuration that was able to take advantage of it, it would. And that can take millions of years. But once it does, and it's a very, very complex system, but over millions of years, things congregate in such a way that they want to find the optimally dissipative configuration. And ultimately, this is what we are. This is what all living life is. And so on this side, the planet Earth with, with life, with humans on it, and as we are literally heating up the planet, that is, that is how we're increasing the entropy of the universe. If not, then it would either find somebody else to use up that energy, or it would um, evolve into something else. But we are here and we are unique, and we are not alone, and it couldn't have happened any other way, and it's impossible to reproduce. So these are all maybe controversial sayings today, but in 10, 20 years, this will be normal thinking. What else do we have here? So remember how we said that our man, Jeremy England, said that, well, we can actually read what he says. There's nobody else here right now. The biophysicist, so he's a real PhD 
physicist, I'm just an amateur. Jeremy England made waves in 2013 with a new theory that cast the origin of life as an inevitable outcome of thermodynamics. His equation suggested that under certain conditions, groups of atoms would naturally restructure themselves so as to burn more and more energy, facilitating the incessant dispersal of energy and the rise of entropy or order in the universe. So this is what we demonstrated over there with our, with, with, uh, our molecules and as we can show with our cells being living. England said that this restructuring effect, which he calls dissipation-driven adaptation, fosters the growth of complex structures, including living things, the existence of life. The existence of life is no mystery or lucky break, he told Quanta in 2014, but rather follows from general physical principles and, quote unquote, should be as unsurprising as rocks rolling downhill. So again, it sounds like a, like a tall claim to say that we're as natural as, as anything in the world because we see ourselves as being so complex and, un, and unlikely. Well, yes, it's unlikely had you wanted everything to look the way it's looking right now in this room, it would have been impossible to reproduce. But as a general normal flow, this is how it ended up. In the same way that if we look at clouds up in the sky, there's clouds, but you'll never be able to reproduce the exact same shape of them. And that's a little bit of chaos theory there. So this little diagram here that shows the ball going down a hill, uh, that's my demonstration or illustration of how us, our, us being here is like a ball rolling down a hill because it's actually the potential energy of the sun increasing, making the hill grow and naturally the ball rolls down. So similarly that if you had like a snowball up on a hill, it's just gonna sit there on a flat surface. But if the hill were to become inclined and increased, the snowball would naturally roll down and collect more stuff and become more complex. So there was a time when even our solar system was in question, the, the structure of it. Today, most humans can agree that the Earth is one of a few planets in our solar system that goes around the sun. A few hundred years ago, this was heresy. This, the sun was the center, and the earth was the center, and the sun went around it. And why? Well, because from our point of view, that's, that's how it was. That's the only way we could make it up. Plus, also, it, it went nicely with the theories of belief systems, of religions, that God made us, and we're the center, and that's all there is to it. But there's some people that came around with a telescope and with observing the sky, they could see weird configurations with some other planets. And eventually like Copernicus and Galileo, they, they could surely see that indeed the, the planet Earth is one of many planets around the sun. And so what do we do? How would we react to that today if, if we hadn't known this? And the analogy is, it's like similar to how today we have real answers to the origin of life and what is life and what are we and are we alone. It is a challenge to present and sometimes controversial because it may not be in line with all of the other belief systems. And so I like to bring about that analogy and ask people, would they be open-minded today if somebody tried to explain to them that the earth is not the center? and there's many other planets and we're not the center of the universe? Or is that complete heresy and craziness? And so that might help us have an open mind about what we currently know and the advances we're making in the evolution of what we know about, about life. So now we're gonna go back to our desk and wrap up, giving people one last chance if they had something to share. And I appreciate this opportunity to be in my studio